Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Balkan Talks. Thank you for listening again. My name is Sandro Slipcevic and as always I'm joined by my very lovely co-host and colleague. Sanir Pasalic. Hello everybody. And today we have another episode for you about a very interesting topic. We have another guest uh, with whom we will be talking about that topic. And uh, before we start with that, I just want to tell you guys that last month we had a very interesting month uh, at WBBG. We had some very interesting uh, developments regarding uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, where we attended a very interesting conference. If you want to know more about that, visit our website um, or find us on social media, media where you can find more about that. Um, but without further ado, let's go to our topic for today. We'll be talking about Albania specifically. Uh, recently, we published one uh, new video about Albania, highlighting the country's potential and everything that's happening in the country. You can find that on our YouTube channel and on Facebook um, if you want to learn more about Albania. And keeping with that trend, we're going to be talking about Albania and the business potential of Albania today with our guest. And uh, yeah, so I won't introduce her. She can do that perfectly fine herself. So without any further ado, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us who you are, what you do, and uh, what we're going to be talking about today. All right. So um, hello, everyone. My name is Veerde Luiting, and I've been active as um, a consultant in the field of sustainability in fashion. So um, I've been in Albania a couple of times, basically for um, yeah, for my projects. Um, so I've been doing some capacity building uh, projects. Uh, I've been working with the universities there. Um, I've been working with people in the garment industry, so with factory owners, uh, garment workers. Um, yeah, basically people from different uh, generations in Albania and in the Netherlands. Uh, I've been mainly involved in project development, advising companies and brand and business development, all in, in the field of sustainability. Okay, that's super interesting. So, uh, Sanir? Yeah, so that's actually how I uh, came across uh, you, actually, your profile online. I was doing research for the video that you mentioned earlier. So I'm actually interested in what brought you to Albania. Why Albania? Why Albania? Well, that started before I started freelancing uh, as a consultant. So before that, I was working for uh, Caesar Netherlands, for the Dutch listeners amongst us. That's, um, well, that's the English version of MVO Nederland, which stands for uh, Maatschappelijk Verantwoord Ondernemen Nederland. Corporate social responsibility is the English version. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So CSR Netherlands is uh, one of the biggest um, business networks in the Netherlands. Uh, that's all about uh, accelerating sustainability in the different sectors. And while I was working there um, as part of the textile team, um, one of the first assignments uh, I started with was um, drafting a project proposal uh, to bring experts, like textile experts, garment experts from the Netherlands to Albania. So together with uh, my colleagues from CSR Netherlands, um, I got in touch with a country I couldn't even uh, couldn't even point to at the map. So <laughs> I, I'll be honest with you, I, I never heard about Albania before. I didn't know where it was situated. Um, I thought it was uh, a big crime scene over there. But uh, yeah, so that's that was the first time um, I've been there, and uh, yeah. Was it so? Was it uh, suggested to you then, that the, the country through the organization? Yes, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah we were collaborating with the um, uh, the Dutch embassy in Tirana and the mm. capital of Albania, and with the Dutch enterprise agency. So that's how I uh, yeah ended up in Albania for the first time, and for a second time as well, uh, together with CSR Netherlands. And uh, yeah. How how, how often have started. you been? Twice. Uh, three times. Three times. Actually. Yeah, oh. yeah. The second time, um, I was already freelancing. Uh, CSR Netherlands. So my previous employer uh, hired me to come along again, um, but this time as a as an independent entrepreneur. And the third time, I went with um, with a team because I um, recorded a, a documentary about the garment industry. Yeah. What was your impression the first time you went to Albania? I'm very interested. Oh, I was um, I was very excited because all the um, all the prejudgments I had and all the assumptions they were just well. In the first evening we arrived, um, I just I saw a very different country from what I had in my mind. So uh, 
well, the first thing I came across was the the hospitality, the food. Um, the, yeah. Have you ever visited any of the countries in the region before? Or was like Albania also your first introduction Never. into the Balkans in general? First introduction. And there were actually some entrepreneurs that uh, we couldn't bring along uh, on that first trip because they were really scared. They didn't dare to go to Albania. Really? They called off. Yes. Um, and uh, when so when I arrived there for the first time, of course, I was with a team and I wasn't alone. But it, I mean, it's one. Yeah, it's a very safe place to go to. In what year was this? This was 2015, and a lot has improved since then. So, uh, but can you even imagine that even in 2015, people would think that Albania would be so unsafe that you can't, couldn't visit as a Dutch entrepreneur? Yeah. So there's yeah. There, there's a um, stigma. There's a stigma, yeah, an image problem, maybe. Yeah, Did, definitely. Have you definitely. have you recently maybe heard in your environment that that image might have changed? Are people around you maybe more positive about Albania or yes. the region? Yeah. Yes. And I think that um, I was just looking up uh, some some companies before uh, I came here for the podcast. And I saw that different uh, companies I visited before have updated their websites. And mm. their communications and marketing channels have, inc- have improved incredibly. So and I feel like it's one of the fastest changing um, hubs in Europe. I mean... It, it, to, to give an example, um, the first time I was there, um, we, we stayed in a place near the main square of the city. And two years later, there were um, three skyscrapers added to the, to, the, to the view. So everything just happens so rapidly right now. Investments are happening. Yeah, it's a momentum. I mean, yeah, definitely. Nice. And could you maybe tell us something about like how when you came there the first time, like how the process went, like where did you go, what did you see, who did you meet, like what what were the causes that gave you like this good impression of the country, which I assume you have, of course. Um, how did it came to be? Uh, well, I have good impressions about the country, and I have seen major points for improvement and um, and risks as well. Um, so. Yeah, let, let's start by just painting a picture. Um, the first time I was there with Caesar Netherlands, we were invited by the uh, by the Dutch embassy and we um, visited um, roughly 20 factories. Uh, we saw them from the inside. Uh, I, sp- I speak Italian, so I could speak a bit with garment workers as well, um, ask them questions about their wages, about their the, the way they work. Why do Albanians speak Italian? Apparently, from what I know, is that during um, during the regime mm-hmm. uh, that lasted until 1992, um, there was a very popular TV channel. It was Italian. Which was in Italian uh-huh. that pe- people were allowed to see. And apparently that helped a lot. And younger generations, um, at, from my experience, younger generations, like our generation, they speak English and Italian hmm. as well. Rather Italian, but also English on an increasing scale. Maybe this is uh, similar to the way uh, Turkish TV shows are now very fashionable and popular in the Balkans, and which also teach people Turkish in a certain Maybe, sense. Yeah. And of course, um, Italy has become a major, a major investor in the country and a trade partner as well. So, I mean, I'm from 1992. Um, I think we, we are roughly the same age. Well... Uh, since since that time, the Italians when the borders opened, they're from Albania. So for any li- anyone who's listening and who who doesn't know, um, Albania has been under a communist regime uh, for a long time, and uh, in the past twenty seven years, after the regime fell and the market opened again, the country was open for foreign trade. Um, the Italians were one of the first to come in and to invest and uh, yeah become a trade partner. And how did you observe this development of, of Albania? Because you say like they're making a lot of big steps. And Albania is, of course, because we at West WBBG, we focus on the Western Balkans. And Albania is, for us at least, the only one, only one country which, is not, which wasn't a part of former Yugoslavia, which hadn't seen a civil war and all of those aspects. Um, do you notice that a difference maybe in any way in Albania's development, that it is... Uh, different than the other countries of the Western Balkans or not? Do you not do you notice this uh, difference? I don't dare to compare since I haven't seen uh, the uh, surrounding countries myself. 
But from from what I've seen in Albania, I've seen a people that is incredibly uh, resilient, um, anti-fragile, um, you may say, and inventive in overcoming major obstacles. In 1997, there was a huge financial crisis that led to a civil war even. Um, it was a fall of a pyramid, a pyramid scheme that uh, basically ruined the country economically and caused major unrest. So, yeah, uh, right now, um, Albania is one of the poorest countries in Europe. Uh, it's the fourth poorest country in Europe. Um, Kosovo is number three. Um, so it's a country that, um, after a very strict regime, um, the market opened again. Uh, many companies were just taken over by foreign investors. Um, then there was a, ma a huge financial crisis. But again and again, uh, the people are building up again. And it's a very diverse country. There's There are people with a, with an, uh, a Muslim background. Um, there are atheists. There are Orthodox. Uh, there's Orthodox Church. But um, from what I've seen, everyone's just peacefully mixing living together and uh, even families are mixed and yeah people are overcoming these obstacles again and again so uh, yeah i think it's uh they are very um they i think albanians adjust very well and uh, they are used to yeah overcoming difficult times and makes make the most out of it yeah, and of course we all know that uh, there are some challenges in, in Albania and the Western uh, Balkans as a whole. It's obviously a, a region that has had uh, a difficult past and, and whose people, are, despite everything, uh, still uh, fight for a better future. Um, but at this podcast, we also really want to talk about opportunities, about the positive sides of the country and about the region and, and what opportunities lie there for people to maybe invest or to their projects. You obviously have a very uh, specific expertise in the garment uh, industry, which is one of the important sectors of, of Albania. Uh, could you tell us maybe a bit more about that and how that, um, what that looks like in the country and, and how, how you've experienced uh, the opportunities in that sector? Definitely. Well, yeah, the garment uh, sector is very important for Albania. It makes up 44% uh, of total exports. So it's a very important sector uh, after oil and gas and mining. So um, the sector employs roughly 150,000 people. That doesn't sound like so much, but knowing that uh, Albania counts roughly 3 million inhabitants. I'm just looking at you, making sure this is correct. It's about correct. Yeah. It's about correct. It's a bit more than, than 2000, I think, 15 or 16, maybe a few hundred thousand more. Okay. But it's about there. Yeah, so it's it's a very small country. Yeah. And um, in Tirana, uh, almost a million people are living there. So that means that um, in the rest of the country, um, well, um, there are not that many people to make up an industry. So uh, 150,000 garment workers for Albania means a lot. Um, ninety five percent is female. Uh, median age is um, quite low. It's thirty one. Oh, it's quite so young. So it's a very young and very dynamic. Well, reports say dynamic workforce, meaning that people are young and they can be educated and they can be trained, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so um, yeah, garment very important for Albania. Um, they produce um, medium up to high quality garments. Albania produces a lot for Italy. Um, mostly for Italy, actually. More than 80% of garment exports are going to Italy to also many luxury brands. So, um, for instance, um, Gianf uh, Gianfranco Ferre, um, Max Mara, um, Roberto Cavalli, those are brands that are produced in Albania. And so that's the, the high segment for any non-fashion person here. And, yeah, so, and what I've seen uh, from... Um, well, in total, I've seen roughly 40 factories by now, and uh, th there's a lot of quality work. Um, the uh, the orders are, well, the, the variety in orders is rather large. So there are factories that produce up to 3,000 units per day. Um, Zara is, for instance, also uh, sourcing now in Albania. So those orders are quite large, um, not Bangladeshi large. If you know what I mean, I, uh, it's not the same as the Far East, but uh, but still large. And uh, but uh, Albania is also a country where 
where smaller uh, orders are possible. And of course, you have the uh, added advantage, I think, maybe that it's close to home for Definitely. Europeans, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so that's something. And also, the, of course, the time zone, the culture, probably, when you compare it to, to Asia, which is kind of a cliche argument, but still, it holds true, I think. Definitely. Also, I've also heard that they export to Germany. Is that correct? Like true. a lot? Yeah. yeah. German, yeah. Germans are... And Greece and Turkey, because those countries are nearby. Yeah. Uh, but um, apparently the Netherlands is the second largest investor in Albania right now. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And is Italy... That's quite exciting. <laughs> um, I think so. Yeah. I, yeah, I think so. Are they also investing that you know of in that industry? Or is it... Um, very little. Still very little. Is it, um, is it like Dutch business or Dutch... Uh, f uh, government funding programs or um, well the trade exchange mm -hmm. remains modest still but uh, the investments that are taking place are growing rapidly I see yeah. I believe that a lot of the investments in Albania are also in real estate nowadays and that's mm -hmm. also one of the sectors in which the Dutch have always been uh, interesting players to say the least uh, yeah also in the region yeah of course the coastline is there as well so it's very similar to Croatia, Montenegro. It is the same line. They say coastline is Croatia, Montenegro. Yeah, but you go, yeah, yeah, of course. Wow. <laughs> so uh, when you go a bit, a yeah. bit more south. Uh, yeah. There's Greece, which is more rocky, even more that's rocky. That's true. So. That's true. So better go to Albania, right? Better go to holiday. Albania. Go yeah. to Albania. Elba Sound, do yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Soon you can book your vacation trips to uh, the Balkan talks. Uh, yeah, is that is that what we're going to do? That would be now? great. <laughs> this is going to be our new franchise that we start. That we start like a travel company. Travel, to, agency. Uh, yeah. travel well, agency. Why not? We can handle that. We as can well. handle that. <laughs> okay. But uh, without the jokes. Uh. So uh, those are some general numbers, but of course you also asked me about uh, any perspectives for growth and opportunities, and. Well, the, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the wages because they are so incredibly low that this is on the one hand a major risk and on the other hand a major opportunity. So um, to give an example, uh, the minimum wage right now in Albania is uh, 260,000 Albanian lek and that's the equivalent of uh, uh, about 210 euros a month. Um, so 210 euros a month is the legal minimum wage. This is not a living wage. And it's even comparable with um, the poorer countries, uh, third world countries in the Far East. So for instance, wow. a garment worker in Albania earns per hour one euro and 22 cents. And that's even lower than the median um, wage in Bangladesh. That would be uh, around three euros, actually. Um, not necessarily for garment industry, but as a as a like a median wage in that country, uh, it, it it doubles the garment wage in Albania. And Albania is a European country, so um, I think many people are not aware of this. Mm. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a legal minimum wage. So any any garment worker that has a contract and health insurance. Uh, earns this wage because the garment industry is an industry where minimum wages are the rule. Um, the problem is that many, or the challenge is, I'd like to say rather, uh, that many garment workers uh, are not contracted. So um, they don't have health insurance, mm. they don't have a proper contract, and they earn even less. So I've talked with women that earn around 100 euros a month for six days a week of work and they work at least eight hours a day um, and they make a lot of overtime. Overtime are the hours you work extra when an order is too large to process in the given time frame. This happens a lot in fashion and uh, over hours should be paid. But this without contracts, this is just not happening. Yeah. So I, I noticed you mentioned uh, at the start of that, that the legal minimum wage is not, is not the actual living wage. No. So why is that not the same? Well, for government, it's very interesting to keep these minimal um, legal wages low to attract foreign investors yeah. because they can offer a cheap workforce. Yeah. 
but um, well, a living wage means that um, that a family is able of um, having a roof above their head, um, pay for medical bills, for uh, send their kids to school, and have have like a um, well a very minimal diet, or at least being being able to afford food and and, and water. So. It's the bare minimum we're talking about. And this is not even... In Albania, this would be um, at least 500 euros uh, for a family of four. So uh, in, if, if we're, we're looking at the garments industry, um, y- there's not even a minimum wage um, if two parents would work full-time, which is m- sometimes more than 60 hours a week. And I can imagine that this is also one of the reasons why you got into the so, uh, corporate social responsibility side of the story. Uh, could you maybe yeah. tell a bit more about that? Definitely. So the risk here is that if you would source in Albania, you need to be very aware that the workers have contracts and that the administration is in order, um, that workers are paid, that they are paid according to to rules, at least, and regulations. Um So the risk is that uh, this is not the case. So it takes a very active approach. If you source in Albania, it means um, if you want to do it well, um, which is very easy. It's very easy to do more than the current status. So it is very easy to make a positive impact. It just means being aware, um, making solid agreements, being more present, Maybe even spending more time on the spot in the factory, uh, work together, send somebody there, um, start joint ventures. So making sure that at least the the paperwork is in order. And that sounds really boring, but if that's not the case, important anything can happen. And is this happening? Are we are we seeing this slowly uh, changing in Albania too? Uh, I think so. Yes, um, I visited some factories that were set up as social factories. And they, they are very aware uh, of these risks and of the lives of, of these women, since we're talking women um, mainly. Um, I find it really um, interesting, actually, that many factories are owned or led by women as well. Really? Yeah. All right. Why yeah. is that, you think? I think that uh, during the communist regime, both men and women were working um, equal amounts. Um, yes. So... I think it it dates still from that time. So they actually kind of maybe even had the um, the women in the workforce sooner than a lot of other countries due to this. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's what we call the socialist heritage of Eastern Europe, I guess. That this, uh, in this sense, in in some sectors you see that it's a lot more progressive. Uh, and maybe in Europe we even were, at least the Western part of Europe we were before. Well, um, it's a different discussion, but if it's out of necessity, then it might not be actually a good thing, right? True. It means that here you could live off of uh, off of only the pay of the husband, for example. You know, but that's maybe a different discussion. Let's keep, let's keep that topic for a different time. Uh, we would. Like, I was quite inspired by it, to, to be frank with you. I mean, I saw these lady bosses running factories, and uh, I was so impressed. I was like, wow, that's nice. cool. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge shoe factory, actually, um, which also exports to the Netherlands. It's, uh, it had a, like a $40 million revenue. Um, uh, it's called Doniana, and it's led by a woman. Um, and, uh, well, she... Uh, She's a boss. She's a boss lady. And she runs one of the biggest companies in the whole sector, if not the biggest company in the whole sector. Nice. Yeah, that's cool to hear. Like, yeah. female empowerment, let's go. Definitely. Let's go. <laughs> but I'm, I'm also interested in, like, as we're talking about this, this topic in, in a certain sense already, that, like, the, the, the business mentality in Albania, like, how, <coughs> when you go to Albania, uh, let's say um, if, if a Dutch person right now who's never been to the country would get onto a plane, Fly to Tijuana um, to open up a, a garment factory. Let, let, let's 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 uh, create this hypothetical situation. Um, what would he experience? What would he see? What or she? W- or, sh- or she? There you go. He or say. she. Um, what would what, what would they experience? And what would your, your advice be to them? Um, to to what should they take into account? Uh, and what can they expect uh, arriving in Tijuana? They can expect a very vibrant place. And they can expect very hardworking people that are very eager 
very, very eager uh, to grow and to, um, to learn and to develop. Um, I also think that uh, the person that is flying to Tirana and um, wanting to uh, produce garments there doesn't necessarily have to start their own factory. There are factories there and they're dying to, to get orders and they need to keep their people employed. So I would say that the ownership should, um, should also be in, in the hands of the locals. And on top of that, um, if you want to do something, something progressive and maybe even, um, well, sustainable or human friendly, uh, so to say, um, I would say, listen, listen to, to the people there. What's, what they need. Um, I've experienced also, I mean, I'm also talking about myself now. Um, in a way, uh, it is very easy to come from um, a highly developed country to uh, a lesser economically developed country and to impose, with good meaning but, or with good intentions, but to impose improvements while... Uh, maybe uh, those improvements are not considered improvements for the locals. So by talking directly one-on-one -on -one to garment workers, which was a challenge, by the way, because they were also really anxious to talk with a strange foreign lady who, and, whom they uh, don't know. English might be a problem. Uh, uh, Italian. That was Italian. Italian. Oh, I, I, yeah. I keep forgetting that you cannot speak Italian. Um, so I, I learned a lot by listening and asking them, so what, what would improve your life? And of course, the first answer is we earn too little. We don't earn enough to support our families and we don't see our kids because we have to work six days a week, at least late hours, in order to make a decent, well, not a decent in order to make an income. Uh, so th these are the usual suspects. However, um, I think it's very important to listen to, uh, to these people. Um, what could improve really? Would it be, would it be childcare? Would it be, well, a better wage of course is, um, is definitely one thing. However, um, yeah, I would say really work together and cooperate. So uh, if you want to source in Albania, I would say do it because the, the quality is good. People are eager to work, to learn. Prices are extremely low. So if you just pay a little bit extra, you are improving lives um, tremendously. And well, any further steps, I would say cooperate, work together. Yeah. But of course, the difficult question is then, and you can probably expect this question, um, if we would raise the minimum wages and we would raise the prices, um, could Albania then stay competitive with countries like uh, Bangladesh or, or these other major garment producing countries? Because I can imagine that at times you can be in a catch train too, that they are very happy with the business they have right now, that they at least have uh, opportunities to sell to uh, the Zaras and the H&Ms of the world. Um, if they would raise the prices uh, um, in this sense, would that cost them business or not? I think they're still, if they would raise prices slightly, uh, they're still at a very, very competitive level. Uh, and also the fact that Albania is so nearby uh, compared to the Far East is very beneficial. And the fact that they can deliver quality and take on all these different order sizes, I think is also very important. Uh, honestly, um, I think that if you uh, if you would work as as a Dutch company with an Albanian manufacturer and you would raise the income there, I think there will be a line of people in front of your door, knocking on the door, asking if they can work there. So uh, that I think that will be the scenario. Um, from all these factories, I, when I talk to factory owners, um, their problem is that they are, in a way, um, fighting for the best workforce. So they're all fighting for the best um, seamstresses. Um, since there are more than a thousand garment companies in this small country, they're all competing to get the best ones into their factory. And the ones that, that pay well, of course, they get the best seamstresses. So... Uh, so then they can also demand a, a, a higher wage if they are the best and they become uh, really wanted and become scarce. Well, I think with paying a little extra, you would attract the best workforce, but also um, you would be able to train um, 
the rest in order yeah. to yeah. improve. Good point. So they'd yeah. also be maybe more inclined to stay probably. Yes, and have like a secure job yeah. with a contract. Because in many factories where I've been, uh, the ladies were just, um, how to say this, how to frame this, um, picked up from the street. Mm. And they get a three-week training. And then they're put behind the machine and they and they work nonstop. Yeah. So it, the majority <clears throat> of the workforce hasn't even finished secondary school. Yeah. So with just um, a tiny effort, you can really make a large impact. Right. Yeah. So just just to uh, briefly summarize, the country has shown that it can handle the orders large and small. It has shown that it can deliver the quality as evidenced by Zara and all these Italian fashion brands. And it's very competitively priced. Yeah. People are young. You can train them. Um, these are all very positive things for any anybody who wants to do business. And you also mentioned you don't have to invest. You can cooperate with already existing uh, fac factories over there. Uh, just source it. That's what there. I would recommend. Yeah, for starters. Yeah. So um, can you maybe think of any risks involved? And, and then, of course, how to counter these risks mm -hmm. or mitigate them in some way. I think that the biggest risk that uh, that's already already mentioned that uh, that paperwork might not be um, in order and that people might be working there um, without contracts and if you know if that reaches the news that that really harms any any company any brand so um, I think that's the, that's the biggest risk basically transparency but that also takes effort from. Uh, mm. a company in order to uh, create tighter ties with uh, contractors and yeah. sourcing companies. So actually, um, I think that Albania is one of these undiscovered um, pearls in the West Balkan uh, that has really an, a really um, fruitful climate to offer in order to do business, but it's just simply undiscovered and undisclosed because um, many of these high fashion brands that source in Albania, they tag their clothes with made in Italy instead of made in Albania. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is happening uh, also in other countries, but it's also happening here because in Europe we have this law that says that if an item is finished in a certain country, then that could be the place where the label is attached. So what these Italian brands do massively is um, the, the clothes are produced in Albania and then they're shipped to Italy, which is just a very short distance. And um, well, the, the final trim or the final, the final step could even be adding the label. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's all made in Albania, but then it gets this made in Italy label and it's sold for, uh, in, for just crazy mock-ups. So, um, yeah, if you see these 200 um, euro shirts from high fashion brands, it could be produced for between 4 to 10 euros um, in, in Eastern Europe. So I think what Albania really needs is more visibility, more ownership. Um, and they should just be disclosed. We should, we should know the quality that, that's made there and all the opportunities that are there. Ed educate educate the the market educate people here about uh, the possibilities so it, people do their own research obviously there's a lot of room to expand and to do business but maybe the nice thing then um, ironically maybe that if people believe that those market Italian brands are made in Italy but the quality is actually Albanian but they really like the quality maybe that says something about yeah. Albanian quality of the garments That's you're really, absolutely right it's, it's positive actually yeah. Yeah, so in that sense yeah. It's some kind of marketing already, and all it they could need be. is, is, is it could be, yeah. all they need is it's got some kind of invisible marketing already, and maybe just they need it to become visible yeah, uh, for definitely. themselves, definitely. because it's it, it's a thing with these made-in brands that they you know historically the, those uh, maybe some a little bit of a different topic, but they all always change historically. Like did you know that 150 years ago, made in Germany was was worthless. It it, it symbolized something of poor quality. But then after the industrialization and Germany formed into a country, it became one of the most highly sought uh, uh, made, uh, made in uh, brands. 
So maybe we should have this some kind of, uh, um, it's also kind of hesitant to say Germanization uh, as or an effect. Or rebranding. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, maybe this, just to have this effect with, with Albania um, in a certain sense, that maybe the main Albania brand can become very, very valuable um, in the textile industry or the garment industry. Well, that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing, right? To change perception of the Albania, of the region. Very yeah. true. To the positive. And uh, I was also very inspired by uh, the youth over there. So I, I've mm. worked with uh, two universities and uh, I interviewed students and uh, brought some students along on uh, my trip in making this documentary. And uh, man, they are so eager to to grow and to to really um help develop their country it was it was very very inspiring that's good to hear definitely they say we just need chances yeah we're so ready just give us a chance right now they're they're working in in call centers um it, mainly italian call centers or they're doing some translation jobs, or at least that's what these, these girls told me. They were studying fashion and art, and they say, well, we're probably going to end up in a call center anyway, but um, or study abroad uh, if the families can afford. But um, it's, yeah, yeah. there's an energy in the air. That's good. It's, yeah. it's something that I think uh, is very, it's very positive, but you see that in the region everywhere. It's like the new, younger generations are like, okay, we're done with the, with that. 80s and 90s and we want to move on we're we're young full of energy you know in the whole western balkans so that's uh, that's amazing that's good i mean well let's let's help those like i said last episode let's help those that want to help themselves and give them a hand where we can but that's exactly what i wanted to say like last episode we talked about is and Last week, when I was in Sarajevo for the for the diaspora conference, yeah, listed was for Bosnia and Herzegovina, but you say, see this same trend all over the Western Balkans of young people wanting to take ownership of their own lives, of their own future, building a better future in the whole region. All they need is a chance, and I really think it's our duty from this side, from 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 uh, the West, let, let's call it that, to help them have this opportunity, to provide them with opportunities, to provide them with investments. Um, to bring businesses over, to show them, look at these people, look at what they can do, and to, yeah, just give them the chance to, to, to show what they can. Yeah, because I think, for example, uh, it, it shouldn't be, and it isn't, a charity case in that sense. For, for example, no. you go to Albania, these, these people are educated, and they're eager, and they want to work, and they're, you know, still relatively low uh priced workforce so you can you and they want to learn they want to grow you can invest in them it's just advantages for your country for your sorry for your company right so it's not a charity thing per se it's just an opportunity but it doesn't have to be like if everybody benefits what's wrong then if, if everybody benefits investor benefits right. the people have a job the young people have something to do there's, the, 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 there's no problem. I don't see a problem. I can I cannot imagine anybody having a problem. I do see some bumps on the road, though. Tell us. Tell us. I don't. I don't want to uh, crack the good mood here. No, go <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but uh, realism is one of the parts uh, of the Western Balkans. So yeah. So um, the bumps on the road. Well, I don't want to exaggerate, of course. Um, these bumps are very easy to overcome. Uh, it's just uh, what, what I'd like to point out is that entrepreneurship and um, creating companies that are not state-owned, that is a very relatively new concept in Albania since for decades it wasn't possible to be an entrepreneur or to found your own company during the regime. So entrepreneurship is as, as young as 27 years right now. So, if you want to start something in Albania with Albanians, I would say um, give give them some tools, show show them, inspire them with what the things that we've learned. Yeah, but maybe this also uh, offers some kinds of uh, unique opportunities because, like, if you would ask me, like, you well, you literally have like a blank slate of a country when it comes to entrepreneurship, and I believe that the most creative and interesting ideas can come from a blank slate. That's why I'm also so, always so enthusiastic when I look towards the Western Balkans and all these countries there. They still have so much room and energy 
and the uh, unspoiledness uh, of doing business and thinking of creative ideas, which I find a, a huge opportunity. I agree. I mean, definitely the creativity um, w- without this, this known framework of how to do business, uh, indeed, there is a lot of, of creativity. Uh, yeah, definitely. I agree. But I'd like to add that because it's a blank slate, um, a lot of, let's say, business concepts, business ideas that are already fleshed out maybe here or in other developed countries, economically developed countries, can be relatively easily transferred to there because the market is in a lot of ways still fresh, like still new. So uh, services and products and you know in- innovations that are maybe very common here uh, can find room to bloom over there, which also might offer an opportunity to local young entrepreneurs who say, look, we have a delivery service in the Netherlands. It works really well, for example. We don't have something like that in Albania. You know, there's no competition, or let's say very little or whatever. So why not just take that concept and put it into work? But that should be, I think, then the co-creation that you together, um, people from Albania, people from, let's say, the Netherlands. It could you, be, yeah. You, on one side, you have the tried and tested you have you know what works and on the other side you have this um this bucket of energy this untapped potential and if you put that together i think that very beautiful things can happen not just in albania but the whole region but in albania and the garment industry has a lot of room for that yeah so it would be the perfect hub to um to enhance uh corporate social responsibility there's a lot of room for um for development for improvements um, as you say, it's a, it's a very fresh market. A lot is a lot is possible. So, if you're a brand and you are looking for any near uh, sourcing opportunities um, with a very creative, very very eager people, Albania is the place to be. And let's uh, talk about that a bit more because I asked you before, like, what advice would you give uh, to a Dutch person getting on a plane going to Tirana? Um, could you maybe explain us a bit more, like how would the process look like? What should you pay? Uh, 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 what should you pay attention uh, to? What parts of the process? Um, and how could could somebody from from A to Z maybe um, start, uh, let's say, importing garments from uh, Albania? I would say uh, make sure that you either um, speak the same language. Or find someone, uh, an agent or a consultant or anyone who knows, uh, preferably both countries, uh, that does speak the language. So you have a mediator or you have someone who understands both parties. So you don't get stuck in either language barriers or cultural barriers. So that would be the first step, I would say. Maybe uh, contact WBBG. I happen to sit uh, at a table with two guys uh, <laughs> who happen to offer that service. Um, but um, I, this is a completely objective advice for all the listeners here. Um, and second would be, especially in fashion, uh, since we're talking garment industry mainly today, um, make sure that uh, the orders that are placed are, um, are well organized together with in either in-house technicians or uh, technicians from your own country, in this case the Netherlands. Uh, so make sure that orders are planned well time-wise, uh, capacity-wise, because where most problems arise in, in, in the garment industry is when orders are taken, because a, a factory owner just hardly has a choice, has to take on orders to keep the workforce employed but the orders are too large or unfeasible and that's where the unpaid over hours and the pressure etc etc comes in so there are very well trained technicians in Albania I would say use these people they are there um, so uh, you don't have to fly in every everything and everyone um, but make sure that uh, this person is well uh, coordinated and next make sure that um, that you keep an eye on the administration and maybe even offer support in how to set that up um, solidly. Uh, yeah, and then I would say just go try and try and test. All right, just go and try. You heard it here. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, maybe it's a good time to slowly so wrap it up. So let's just quickly summarize globe, you know, in general what we talked about. Um, we talked about Albania. We talked about the uh, potential of the country when it comes to the garment industry, about uh, what kinds of sizes of orders you can place, what kind of other already established brands and countries already source in Albania. We talked about the young population and uh, workforce in Albania, how they're eager, how they want to learn. Uh, we talked about a few risks and uh, also how to overcome those risks. For example, the um, make sure you, that you really that you really pay attention to the details and prepare yourself when you go out there to also share your knowledge and so on. A lot of things covered. Um, is there maybe something? else that final word that you would like to put out there to our listeners um anything important that you like this is something that should, they should take away yeah well th uh, this is a, something before the takeaway so one important thing we haven't mentioned yet is that albania is not a member of the european union mm. which means that there is not a free movement of uh, people and goods so it means that there are still trade tariffs mm. um handled and Albania is, as far as I know, um, in the process of uh, becoming a member state or at least being a candidate for uh, a membership of the European Union. And it would definitely, definitely speed things up um, in terms of bilateral trade, um, but also trade with other European countries if Albania becomes a, a European membership. But you're seeing that we're making steps uh, with regards to Albania because uh, a few weeks ago or a month ago, the EU, uh, the European Commission, uh, published new reports which stated that Albania has made uh, significant steps. So That's amazing. I think we, I can, know we, that. we can be optimistic about uh, the accession in the future. Yeah. Very good. All right. Anything else you'd like to plug, present? Well, the biggest takeaway is that Albania has so much to offer. Um, it's an undiscovered diamond and i really dare to say that um yeah so don't be afraid um it's not the wild west uh it's a safe country um go and explore all right beautiful words nice message for sure all right thank you so much everybody i think we're gonna wrap up right there virla where can people contact you if they do want to reach out to you they can uh, at my website, which is www.fearlighting.com. And I guess also through you guys. That's correct. Thank you so much. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much for listening to uh, this podcast of uh, the Belkin Talks. Make sure to check us out on our social media channels. Uh, look at us. Look us up at Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Recently, we also started a YouTube channel where we will be posting a video content. So make sure, make sure you subscribe. And of course, for those people that uh, like to just enjoy the audio, we are on all major uh, podcasting platforms, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Make sure to leave us a good rating and we will talk to you very soon. Thank you so much. See you later. Bye-bye.